Martin and Carl Reiner first collaborated as actor and director in 1979 on The Jerk. Now their fourth collaboration, All of Me, in which Steve Martin stars with Lily Tomlin under Carl Reiner's direction. Steve Martin said, stand-up comedy is transient. Movies are a lifetime career. It's the A-list of show business as far as I'm concerned. And we'll be right back with Steve Martin and a scene from all of them. Steve Martin with Richard Libertini and the beautiful Victoria Tennant in a scene from All of Me, watching that scene and being aware. I was uh, uh, kind of curious how uh, the audience watching that cold who has no idea what's going on in that scene, I, I'd be curious to know how they react to it. You know what I, my question is about that scene and everything you do in All of Me with someone as outrageously funny and inventive as Richard Libertini. Oh, he's good. Who is yeah. a New York actor who does television, who goes back and forth between the coasts, and isn't someone that the public at large is aware of, but I have the feeling that you, being the actor you are, must have gotten particular pleasure out of the ease with which you and Lily and Carl mm -hmm. Reiner give him those scenes. Well, he, um, you know, that particular scene, right, right at the end where I'm going, go fix bull, go, 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 go. We never made it without laughing. You know, we come around for close-ups and, and, you know, we shot it for four hours because we'd always go, go, go and look at each other and start laughing. And on that, that very shot, as soon as we turn, we're going, I'm going, go. He's going, go. He doesn't understand English. That's why he keeps repeating what I say. He goes, go, go. And as soon as we turn, we're both just laughing so hard. It was a, it was a, every, in a, once in every movie, there's a scene like that that's very hard to get through. We are here talking about all of me and your work with Lily Tom and Richard Liberty. That's a Liberty. great coincidence because Isn't I it? was going to talk about that too. Were you really? Yeah. Well, aren't you glad we're both here? Yeah, it's and we really both agree? fortunate. Do you mind, however, if I tell you I always wonder what it means to an artist after the fact when it appears that the public has rejected something and then you encounter a total stranger like me who tells you that Pennies from Heaven, for me, is one of the great American musical dramas. And I sat here once with Pauline Kael in that chair who went on for almost 30 minutes mm. on why you were brilliant, why it was a great film, and why the great movie-going public at large didn't seem to want it. Does it mean anything to the artist after the fact and what's considered a failure to be told it was loved? Well, it's, um, you know, that's an odd moment in my life because I love the film too. I still love it, even though it was a commercial flop. I think it was, an, I don't want to say artistic, but it was sort of an emotional hit for me because uh, I love the writing. And I, it was a chance to, I just felt so lucky to be in that movie because every scene was so rich and human and warm and, and filled with every kind of emotion from, you know, love and hope to greed and envy. Uh, so, you know, when it came out, I, I never expected it to do real well going in when I first when I decided to do it. I didn't think it was going to do well because I knew it was esoteric. But then as you start working on something and you've given so much to it, and it's, we've been shooting for 20 weeks and you've rehearsed for six months, and uh, then you start to, your hope starts to be say, hey, this, this is so good and it seems so easy for everyone to understand that you, you do think, well, this has a big shot. And uh, MGM gave it, you know, every opportunity. They were great with the promotion and publicity. And I, I, I understand why the public probably didn't like it, but also, you know, it's, it's living on. <laughs> The film. I was in an elevator the other day and someone said, uh, oh, I saw Pennies from Heaven uh, recently. I said, where? where? And she said, uh, film school. I said, I got a little satisfaction out of that. When you were doing Pennies from Heaven, I should point out that your collaborative work with Carl Reiner goes back to 79 in The Jerk. Right. When The Jerk was originally called Easy Money. Right. And you had a screenplay and you had been working for months on it. What propelled you, Steve? What got you to Carl Reiner? to give him the jerk, then Easy Money, which would become the jerk. Why? Did you know him? Had you met? Well, I had met, I had worked with Rob, who was my writing partner on the Smothers Brothers show for just a, a moment, a week. And uh, Carl came in one day, it was very nice, but we didn't really talk that much. And I'd met him maybe once or twice since, that was 1969, by the way, 70. And when we, uh, looking for a director for the jerk, 
uh, my manager suggested Carl Reiner. I said, oh, that would be great. And we approached him and he did it. The rest is an anticlimax. <laughs> no, the rest leads to your fourth collaborative right. effort, All of Me. But I, I go back to that because you talked about working with Herb Ross, who we know is a great filmmaker, mm -hmm. and Nora Kay, and that whole group of people. But you said that Herb Ross guided you through Pennies from Heaven. Often you didn't know what you were doing. You didn't mm -hmm. question what you were doing, and it wasn't the creation of a character. It was doing what the director asked you to do. Mm -hmm. When we look at all of me, and it's the fourth time that you and Carl Reiner are together, and Carl Reiner maintains that he feels the people who make the best people movies are failed actors who might have always been closet directors. If Carl Reiner has that attitude, are you working on the creation of the character and knowing exactly what you're doing comedically? Well, I feel, uh, you know, since this is my sixth movie, I feel wiser now and, and more uh, uh, knowledgeable about creating a character. And I think all of me is the first uh, real um, comic character I've played that is a person who is grounded in reality, who's a real person that people can identify with, a lawyer, a normal guy, uh, with a, a mini crisis in his life of whether he wants to really be a lawyer or whether he wants to be a musician. So it's kind of a, it's an average guy in a way. And uh, every other character I've played has been way out there, <laughs> you know, very bizarre. Although I think Pennies from Heaven was a real character, but that's another issue. So I feel uh, pleased, you know, that the, that the character does come across as real and funny. You know, we, we're, it's, it's a guy who gets himself into a whole lot of trouble. <laughs> True. Which well, I, you, you know, I love that in a movie when you're watching and suddenly a picture just sort of takes off you know, after the first 15 minutes, which is spent you know, establishing characters. And then the, suddenly this thing happens in any movie and you're just locked, you know, staring. Go on, tell me that story. When you say regular guy, and I think if you're finishing work with Arthur Hiller on Lonely Guy, mm -hmm. and for the first time in your traveling life, going off to London and Paris alone, and you said at one point you walked into a restaurant, table for one, you get taken up to a room where there are other real-life lonely guys, and it felt, I mean, well, it's beyond whole, deja vu. I had a whole, after I finished the film, I thought, I think I'll take a little vacation, and I well, wasn't uh, seeing anyone at the time, so I thought, well, I'll go to London alone. You know, I know, I know people there. So I arrived on uh, a uh, Friday night, and it was very hot and very humid, and uh, I thought, well, I'll go have a nice little dinner by myself, get a little bottle of wine, and it'll, it'll be great. So I went to this restaurant at 8.30, and I said, um, I'd like a table for one, and he went, upstairs. It was an Italian restaurant. So I go upstairs, and there's like four other single guys, and then there's this dashing couple, a handsome man and a beautiful woman having a great time. So we're all sort of depressed, and I say, I'd like some, uh, waiter comes over, fettuccine, goes in the kitchen, comes back with 30 seconds with the fettuccine and a glass of wine, and I'm done by 8.35. And <laughs> there went my sort of solo evening. Then I started hiking around London, really looking for something to do. And finally there was a screening of Flashdance at uh, 11.30 in uh, Leicester Square. And I hiked down there, and it's steamingly hot. And I went in and sat, and all the couples are pouring in. and. Uh, and then I'm sitting there about 25 minutes into the movie, and the character says, and I feel really depressed. And the character on screen says, I want to be like Eddie Murphy or Steve Martin. I go, ew, you don't want to be this. <laughs> Not tonight, anyway. <laughs> you know, so I'm fine now, but don't feel sorry for me. OK, on that, we will take a commercial break. Okay. Be right back with Steve Martin. Steve Martin is with us. We have been talking about All of Me, your film, in which you star with Lily Tomlin, directed by Carl Reiner. Somebody asked me about, about watching All of Me, and I said, without minimizing what Tootsie did, or what Barbra Streisand did with Yentl, or even La Cage Fall, that I thought in terms of the 80s that All of Me might indeed be the precedent setting, to use the hip terminology, gender-bending comedy that will force people with a smile on their faces instead of fear in their hearts and in their sex organs 
into recognizing that we really are components and that we are male and female. And I was thinking of your friend and co-star Lily Tomlin's line about, you must correct me if I get this wrong because it's difficult, that it was easier to make a woman out of a man than to make a man out of a woman. And where, 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 in what context did she say it, this? All of me. When she was talking about if she had had total control over all of me, mm -hmm. she would have left Edwina oh, right. in, in Roger. In, inside us. Well, and then just let it go on that way and deal with it. And I thought, that's interesting. Well, we did go back and forth on it. Actually, uh, there were a lot of considerations about the ending. But I felt, you know, if, if um, <clears throat> Lily did stay inside me, d just so the audience will know what happens is... Uh, Lily's soul gets inside of me and takes over one half of my body. So half, one half of me walks like a woman and the other half walks like a man. And occasionally she can speak uh, in a, a voice like this. And, uh, and it you know, causes me comedic situations. Um, I think we felt that if, if she had stayed, you know, the audience, uh, as they're leaving, goes, uh, well, gee, what's next for those two? <laughs> and it gets a little... Uh, it gets almost too complicated for life to go on. I'm, I'm glad that it uh, you know, wrapped up in a happy, sweet, sweet way. It is a light comedy. So I, I prefer the uh, sort of happy ending over the um, uh, intellectual one. Maybe. You know one of the things that surprises me about you in terms of just thinking of you and is it Bill McEwen, your right. associate for many years, mm -hmm. and being in Las Vegas and learning so much about a personality that we think we know a lot about. Of course, we never know what we believe we know about people anyway. But to have Elvis Presley come backstage to see you and to tell you how much he liked your work and that you and he shared something, the well, same oblique sense of humor. He came back, uh, first, you know, he was a gigantic person. And the first, uh, I was just standing in my dressing room. I was opening for Anne Margaret, actually. And, uh, Priscilla came around the corner, who, who is or especially was strikingly beautiful, and you know I was like saw her like this. She was all dressed in white, and then Elvis, who was uh, gigantic, came. I think he was six four or, or something, and had a huge he had a gold belt buckle, and he was all dressed in black. And he started to go in Anne Margaret's dressing room, and then he turned and he caught my eye, and he came in. He said, "Son, you have an oblique sense of humor," just like that. <laughs> we ended up. My, my manager was. Uh, you know, a real fan knew the whole history of Elvis, so we started talking to him. We talked to him for a long time, maybe 25 minutes, and uh, one of his, you know, he had a lot of aides around him, mm -hmm. and one of his men came over and said, Elvis, uh, we have to go now. And Elvis went, it's okay. And then we talked for another 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't Bill McEwen say something specific about the songs, and Elvis said that actually it had never been his music, rock and roll. He liked Italian ballads and the something crooners. Like that, yeah. Just that Goldman, Albert Goldman, didn't get that kind of revelation in the book. You know, there wasn't that moment where he said, Elvis Presley said the word oblique to Steve Martin? Yeah, I, uh, I didn't read the book. I, I don't like to read. I, I didn't read the Belushi book, and I didn't read that book. It's just too ugly for me. I just... Is it too ugly, Steve, because you have a fear of what you already know might be in it, or because you don't want to be reminded of things you no, worked I hard think to get I, rid I, you of? You know, I, I read a... Um, an excerpt of the last days of John Belushi, and it was, it was just too, too ugly. I mean, uh, true or false or slanted, it just didn't please me to read it. You know, it just it made me sick. I thought, I don't want to go through that. Are you closer than you... I, I ask you this about Dan Aykroyd. Because of your work together, mm -hmm. and because of his respect for you, and you said that you knew him to a point, that there was, mm -hmm. you knew Dan Aykroyd and it stopped. And well, I wondered if a, a couple of years have gone by since you made the remark. Is it close? Do you see each other? No, we really don't. We live in different uh, towns. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we like each other. We just never became, like, you know, best pals. I mean, there's a lot of people like that. I mentioned pennies from heaven, but it's something that you have great pride in that is a wonderful moment of television. You're dancing with was it Gregory Hines, with whom you oh, did that. Oh, I love that, yeah. And it, it was just so extraordinary. You said yourself that you could feel the audience sort of going, 
we or yeah. responding to the fact that you were doing it for real. Well, what happened was, you know, I just finished Pennies from Heaven, so I had all this sort of tap, tap dancing, I won't say expertise, but I, had, uh, I, I could tap. And uh, I did a special with Lorne Michaels in New York, which was live. And, you know, we started singing this silly song. Uh, I can't remember what it was right now, but... Uh, and then we burst into this tap number, and I, and I felt the audience go, oh, like that, and I felt like an entertainer for the first time in my life. You know, like, they were like really honestly, hey, you know, feeling good and happy. And you get to dance with Lily. Yeah. Quite a dance with Lily. Every movie I, that, that's been a hit, I, I'm counting all of me as a hit, as, as dancing at the end. <laughs> I think you should count it as a hit. I feel good about it. Last night was a good screening here. A lot of people, uh, I poke my head in every once in a while, and they were laughing in all the right places. All right, on that we will take another break. I'll okay. be right back with Steve Martin. Steve Martin is with us. We've been talking about all of me, Lily Tomlin, Carl Reiner. When I was complimenting you on the dancing and the skills that Danny Daniels assisted you with to prepare you for Pennies from Heaven, which you've carried right into all of me with one of the more uplifting and the best uses of the word endings I've ever seen on a romantic comedy, all of me, where you and Lily literally dance mm -hmm. off the screen together. I think of Carl Reiner telling you early on in your collaboration, and it's a wonderful line, about you're the kind of guy who looked at Fred Astaire and said, I can do that, well, and said, went out and did it? Well, that's what he said about my act. He says, that's what your character is on stage. This is the kind of guy who says, ah, oh, I can do that, and he goes out with all the confidence in the world and, and does, you know, does, t does it terribly, but has never believes that he's uh, not doing it as well as Fred Astaire. You know, with Lily Tomlin's determination to go back onto the stage and your determination after your years of touring and traveling and one-night stands, to avoid going back on the stage. I think of that particular incident, you used to talk about those teenage kids who would sit in front of you mouthing the word quaaludes through your act until you were delirious, trying to concentrate. Well, there was a period uh, in, in, I think, all of concertizing, peop all the people who did concerts, and it was, I think it was promoted by that show Rock Concert, where you know the, the audience was out there screaming their heads off. And, and that's appropriate, I guess, for rock music. But as a person opening, or as a comedian, it was very um, disheartening that people yell through your show. That's when I quit opening and started headlining, drop, you know, dropping my pay, dropping my uh, size houses. And, or and on just the Grammy, Steve, dropping your pants. Oh, <laughs> I did a lot of that, I think. <laughs> uh, now, I was thinking, too, of that night that the guy threw, you had a beer can that had a T-shirt wrapped around it, but the T-shirt came loose and the beer can hit you. Well, I thought, uh, see, all I saw was a, a missile coming at me. Someone was actually, like, they wanted to give me a T-shirt. So uh, they wrapped it around a beer can so that it'd have, like, a, you know, weight to it and throw it. And the T-shirt flew off immediately, and I, I saw this object come flying at me, and I thought I was, you know, you know being peltered with something. So that sort of spooked me, and then I understood what happened and uh, continued with the show. You know, a lot of little things like that happened. It's like Barbara Streisand saying why she won't perform live. She said she's afraid she moved around so much on the stage. The last time she did it, she thought she was a moving target and was sure somebody out there was going to get her. And it turns out not to be remotely funny. She means it. Mm -hmm. The fear. No, I never had that fear, really. Uh, uh, I, I uh, actually started thinking. I did uh, actually the Merv Griffin show the other day. I'm going to do the Tonight Show. And I hadn't been in front of a live audience in a long time. And I felt pretty good, and I felt uh, relaxed, whereas before, you know, I felt such, so much pressure to be really good that you, uh, you know, that it ceases to be fun, and I think uh, the fun sort of back in it now for me. If someone asked you, for example, to replace Tommy Toon in my one and only on Broadway, would you do it for a few months? Uh, actually, it's funny, I was asked, but I decided not to. Because, Why not? Well, he's, first, he's so good. He sings great, and he dances great. And to go in there with my voice and my dancing ability would be, you know, I just, uh, I couldn't do as well as he, he did. And plus, I, uh, you know, I did shows every night for so long. I don't like that thing hanging over my head. I like to do movies, and we finish the movie, and, and we look at it, and then we go around the country, and we talk to people, and we show it, and we see the audience reaction. It's just nicer for me right now. All of me is available to moviegoers. What happens next? Um, Got a film lined up? 
Uh, uh, no, I don't. I'm uh, thinking about certain, other, you know, certain films, and I've written a couple of scripts, and I, I think I'll wait till all of me hits the screen and see how it does and relax a little bit. All right. I've enjoyed being with you. Thank you. You're welcome. I enjoyed it.